Would you please welcome Dr. Mark Dosser. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Gosh, it's nice to be here in Des Moines. I, I, I've done 1100, over 1,100 of these presentations over the last 15 years, and I've been in a lot of places in America, but I've never been in Iowa before, so this is my first time to speak to an Iowa audience, so thank you for letting me be a part of your event today. Uh, I used to live in Wichita, Kansas, and we'd take some vacations. I spent more than, well, I spent three different times at Adventureland with my kids back in the 80s, so I remember Des Moines from that point of view. Uh, I'm just curious, have any of you in this audience heard me speak before? If you have, would you raise your hand? Okay, half a dozen? Okay, well, I need to warn the rest of you then. Uh, you may not have ever heard me speak before, but I don't do Zig Ziglar power positive thinking, let's put some lipstick on a pig and sell some kind of speech. And I don't have any self-esteem, so frankly, I don't care if you have any either by the time I'm done. Uh, it's not my agenda. I don't care if you like me, I'm not an entertainer. My agenda today is the same as it's been for the last 15 years to try to give my audience a toolbox of information to help them make good business decisions, period. For you, your clients, your family, that's it. I can't talk about the economy without talking about politics a little bit. I don't like talking about politics. Uh, I don't like political conversation. I view it as 99% content free and I avoid it at all costs. But you can't understand the economy without taking into account the political repercussions of this massive intervention of our U.S. government into our daily lives. So I will be talking about it. You may, and I, just as a disclaimer, I was born in Kansas. We don't have Democrats in Kansas, so I was born a Republican. Uh, no, don't clap. Uh, I changed parties three years ago because now I'm a registered cynic. I don't believe any of them. Okay? <laughs> So uh, I'm going to make some comments about government policy. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. I'll probably make you mad at some point in the deal. I'm talking to business people about business issues. I know it's a political year, and I know you just had your big party a couple weeks ago, so you're all on itch about politics. Well, I'm not. Okay? I'm talking to businessmen and women about making decisions and investments. So, when I talk about politics, I don't care if you're man won or you're man lost, I'm not interested in that. Let's just keep it to the, uh, to the business side of things. And I've been to uh, Baltimore and Philadelphia and Fort Lauderdale in the last year or so, so I don't just hang out in western Texas where it's safe to talk like this, uh, even though it has been rather dry. I, I said it this morning, go ahead. I'm sure you're aware of it. The speakers that you've had up here at this point have been spectacular. I've been taking notes. I write a blog. Uh, actually, in fact, I might put that up there. It's possible. We don't sell advertising on our blog, but it's possible some of you might find this presentation interesting. And uh, uh, on our blog site there, I expand on a lot of these topics in more detail uh, if you want to check it out. I was taking some notes, and I want to respond to a couple of things that I've heard already this morning. Uh, one, the gentleman that was up first talking about the weather, he's talking about higher volatility in the weather and crop prices, and I think we could see some higher volatility in land prices. I mean, when land prices go straight up, that's called no volatility at all. If we are looking at the possibility of some volatility in land prices going forward, there's a lot of people out there that think farmland is in a bubble, even the Federal Reserve Bank, president of the Kansas City Fed. They started talking that way a year ago. It's no secret that some people think farmland is in a bubble. But with that in mind, I understand why people will probably continue to buy farmland in 2012. And the reason for that are the same reasons that people are probably going to continue to buy gold in 2012. I've been recommended to people that are thinking about buying gold for the last four years that if you're even thinking about buying gold, I'd recommend you just take cocaine instead because at least you'll feel good before it kills you. <laughs> and you know what? People used to laugh at that a lot until now I see nuts out there like, Edward, I told you we shouldn't have bought gold. <laughs> I know a bunch of you got positions in gold, and I know why. I can tell you without exception, and I don't exaggerate anything. I have I do 100 speeches a year, probably 15 to 18 thousand. So in the last two years, 33 thousand people. I haven't met one person in America that thinks that Congress will do the right thing to begin to balance the budget. It's a 100% held consensus they will not do it. 
And if that's the case, it means they will continue to print a trillion and a half dollars a year. And when a government does that for a sustained period of time, the value of your savings declines. Simple as that. So some person might be buying gold because of that. I've been telling people for several years, because I don't like gold, and here's why, because I saw what happened to gold in 1981. Anybody remember that? Anybody remember a guy named Paul Volcker? Yeah. When Paul Volcker walks into the room, that's like Grandpa walking in and spanking everybody. Okay? And if Paul Volcker comes in the room, if you own gold right now, your worst nightmare is you wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and you're kind of, of course, I'm in the farm country, so you wake up at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> I do that too. I don't even farm. It's just heartburn from big meals and that before. But, so I share your pain. Huh? Okay? Here's your biggest nightmare. You're a little bit dreary at 3.30 in the morning, and you can't really read. You open up the paper, and you go, what's that say? Congress does the right thing. Well, the gold market will have gone down 200 bucks before you can even find the telephone. That's the risk. Gold got to 850 bucks back in 1980 or so when we had real inflation of 12%. Not just because you think we might get inflation, we don't have it right now. We had real inflation at 12%. Gold was somewhere around 850, 860. And within about six months, it was at 380 bucks and it stayed there for 16 years. That's not a good investment. You do not invest in commodities. You can speculate in commodities, and you can hedge risk with commodities. You don't invest in commodities. Now with that said, I tell people, I understand if you don't believe government will ever do the right thing, I understand, but rather than do gold, why not buy farmland? And that's what's happened. Not because I said it, it's the logical thing to do. And so as we go into 2012, I don't care if the president of the Kansas City Fed says maybe cropland's in a bubble. Well, so what? Because if your government continues to present to print a trillion and a half a year, we ain't seen nothing yet when we get a bubble going like that. It's not because the land is going up in value, it's because the dollars that it takes to purchase it are declining in value. That's the issue. Fact. A coin dealer gave me this bill the other day. Actually, it's about a year ago now. I'm ruining it because it's... This is what people are afraid of. This is why people are buying gold for 1600 bucks. These are why people are buying crop land and other kinds of ag-related stuff, land, because of this. This is what they don't want to see. This bill right here is the highest denomination currency on the planet ever printed. It's from a country called Zimbabwe. And what happened there, they turned on the printing presses and never shut them off. This bill right here, this one piece of paper is a $100 trillion bill. <laughs> and it buys lunch today. See, that's what your government can do. If they don't do the right thing, if they don't raise taxes and cut some spending, then all they'll do is print money and run bigger and bigger deficits and destroy your savings. End the story. So that's why I can say at the same time, cropland is perceived to be in a bubble, and at the same time say it's possible it could go up dramatically in value even further from right now. Now with that volatility in mind, my advice is if you're determined, it's like, okay boss, I don't care what you gotta say, I'm buying more land this year because I got some money and I don't know what to do with it, and I don't wanna get zero interest on my CD. All I would tell you is, is if you're facing volatility like this, you've got to keep the leverage low. And that goes for cropland or commercial real estate, any of it. Because what you don't want to do is pay a nice price for it, hoping it's going to go up, and then see crop prices drop for a year or two, and then you lose the property and let somebody else foreclose it and then make money on it later on. I, in my mind, for me personally, for my retirement account, if I was going to buy farmland in Nebraska or Iowa or someplace like that, which I think is a great idea. I don't want any vintners or stuff like that in California. I don't want any grapes or tomatoes. I want corn, oats, and wheat, and the staples of life. We got a long way to go to enhance and improve the productivity of Iowa farmland let alone think about other countries that are so far behind. And you know what happens? What that tells me is, if you get a spike in 
crop prices for a while, you're going to see all kinds of extra productivity come out of the ground here in Iowa and everywhere else in this country and all over the planet. And that means to me is that the premise that we're going to see high crop prices for the rest of my lifetime because China's getting wealthy doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't bet a penny on that, on that assertion. Because when prices go up sufficiently and stay there for a while, we'll start planting parking lots again and the rest of it. So anyhow, again, keep in mind, I'm just an economist. That means there's a 50% chance anything I say is wrong, and I'm totally comfortable with that. <laughs> but you could have paid half a million to get Greenspan here, and he's easy 50% wrong. And up until about a year and a half ago, I was really worried that you'd get Bernanke here for like 500 bucks, and I'd be out of a job. So they put him back in office again. Uh, two other things here before I get rolling, and we're going to finish on time. Um, Somebody in the Q&A asked about the housing market, and the answer from Vince uh, was accurate, uh, and I want to expand on it a little bit. He said there might be a surprise from Obama on housing coming up here with the State of the Union or something. Well, my response to that is, it better be a good surprise. And it better not be something about more government intervention to stop foreclosures from happening because it's destroying our country, all right? That everybody on earth, you could have a whole panel of Nobel Prize winning economists up here. Of course, we all know you don't have to do much to earn a Nobel Prize anymore, but assume you do. All right? So you got all up there and you say, what's the biggest, quote, headwind to the U.S. economy? Oh, well, it's housing. Oh, it's housing. It's housing. Well, what would you do to fix it? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Do you ever hear of anybody talking about real plans to fix the housing market other than bellying about it? I don't. Well, here's, the, here's what has to happen. You got four and a half to six million homes that have delinquent mortgages on them. They're either going to be foreclosed or will, are already in the process, and the banks can't get the job done. They don't have enough people to foreclose, and everybody on earth knows that, and all the home buyers in America know that, and they're afraid to buy houses because of this avalanche of homes that ultimately may have to come into the market, and they're afraid of the lower prices. Here's a simple answer to when our economy will turn the corner. It will be when the single family housing market turns the corner. And when that turns the corner is when we foreclose on these four and a half to six million homes and get them out of the banking system and into private investor hands. So if we hear a surprise come, I never listen to state of the unions. I don't listen to anything related to politics. I think my wife's worse than I am. I mean, we wouldn't have a TV. It'd be broken every time we try to turn it off. So I'm not going to listen to the state of the union either. I don't need to know it. I can feel it from talking to y'all. But if there's any talk about housing, if he uses the words, we're going to foreclose the smithereens out of this country, then buy. Go along, sell your gold, and buy stock. If he comes out and goes, well, the victims of America here deserve to have the principal of their mortgages reduced and crammed down and lower their interest rates to 2% and extend the amortization for 45 years. You better run for the hills, okay? <laughs> if you got land for sale, buy some more. Just take a sign down and go buy some. <laughs> Last thing, a young man that got up here a minute <laughs> And, and Ken, our moderator, caught him off guard by making some point about women of childbearing age. I'm glad you didn't say it to me because I would have got flustered and not said anything either. All right, that young man, he's talking about being in Africa and looking at farmland around the rest of the world. Here's a little something you need to know about that too because the premise of bigger prices and more demand from all of these emerging markets getting richer, guess what the little problem is here? Here's how this little chain reaction works. Greece can't pay its debts, Spain, all the rest of those places, they can't pay back their bonds. Guess who owns them? The big banks over there in Spain and France and Germany and the rest of those European banks. And guess what? Those, loan, those bonds aren't going to be repaid and they're going to create insolvency in the major banks in France and Germany and Spain. And guess who makes almost all of the loans to quote emerging markets in Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, Eastern and Central Europe? It's not your local bank here, it's those big banks in Europe. So think of all the small businessmen and women all over the globe in these emerging market countries that have loans with Societe Generale or BNP Paribas 
or Barclay Capital or whatever, and those banks are on the verge of insolvency, and when their little loan comes due and they need to refinance it again, it may not happen. So we're going to have a gigantic, just like when Ben Bernanke told everybody in 07, there's no credit crisis, it's all contained, the subprime mortgage, there's no contagion in any other markets, and I was saying a week later, it's like, I know better than that, I can't explain why he's saying that, it was basketball season, so I said, you know, I'm not saying that the Fed is lying to the American people, I'd prefer to just say they're giving them head fakes like in basketball, it's all contained, there's no contagion. That's what you're not hearing right now is there's going to be intense credit pressure all over the globe because those European lenders are the bankroll for businesses in all these emerging markets. Okay, so now I'm going to start my speech. <laughs> so we're going to finish on time. Okay, this story is this. If I didn't know better, if I was just a straight-up economist looking at nothing but charts, I would get up here and tell you 2012 is going to be a huge year of expansion. By the way, a few of you are looking at these slides. If you find this to be of interest at all, if you leave a business card with me at the end here, I'll be happy to email it to you. And you got my permission to take my name off of it and put your name on it and give it at the local Rotary Club if you like. But I'll be happy to send it to you. If I didn't know better, I would tell you we're in a we're in the middle of a big expansion. The numbers look like it, and I'm going to show you that because the underlying U.S. economy is a lot stronger than some of the people in the media would like you like you to think. See, keep in mind I don't watch a whole lot of media. All I watch is professional golf and the NFL and CNBC. As far as I know, there's about only three things you can buy in America anymore based on the commercials I see. Buick, Cadillac, and Cialis. That's the only thing I know you need to buy anymore. The underlying economy, in my mind, is spring-loaded for recovery. What's holding it down? It's kind of like Jack in a Box. Turn the switch. After a while, lever opens. Boom! Jack in a Box pops out, spring-loaded. What's holding it back? What's keeping the lid on the jack in the box? Regulation and largely Congress. 100%. Nobody in this country has any faith in Congress to do anything right. Everybody understands we're going in the wrong direction. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we all agree with that. They still don't do it right. They don't want to. I don't know why. I can't quite explain that. But let me tell you the good story, and then I'll explain to you why it's not happening. Because what I want you to focus on what's not happening is not because I'm a pessimist. I want to, that's a laundry list of what we need to do to get things going again. And so if your president of mine ever shows up on TV and starts addressing the things that are keeping the lid on the jack in the box, that means we're closer to a recovery. And if he or, and the Congress come out and say things like, oh, here's this, all that means is more weight on the lid of the jack in the box, then we're not going to have the recovery. And frankly, it's kind of weird because I have a feeling that agricultural farmland will continue to appreciate and value more if we don't have a recovery than if we do. That's kind of weird to think. Think about it. But I think there's people out there buying farmland for the same reason they're buying gold, that we won't have a strong enough recovery and our government will print unlimited trillions of dollars and destroy our currency, so I'm going to buy more land right now at the record price. I don't mind paying $8 more than the last record price because my government will destroy my currency and I want to have something other than a CD earning 0%. Corporate profit. Look, you do not, excuse me, just a second. Are there any business school deans in the audience? Okay, good. Here's a little secret. You do not have to have a bachelor's degree to forecast job growth. This is America. It's called capitalism. Simple as that, at least for another six weeks. And here's the thing in capitalism. When profits are up, people hire. When profits go flat, they stop hiring. And when profits go down, people start firing. And they keep firing people till profits go up. That's all you gotta know. So you look at this chart. Profits, corporate profits are at record highs. And they're not hiring. There's two trillion dollars in cash sitting on corporate balance sheets earning nothing in money market accounts. And they're not hiring. Corporate cash flow is at record highs. And they're not hiring. So you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Here's some more good news. 
The first third of my speech is the good news, so get real giddy about it because it's going to get rough for your mother. Okay? Here's some good news. I've, I've never presented this slide up until three months ago because it's never mattered. This is unemployment benefits. See, we're extending unemployment benefits for a million years. That's just how it's working. That'll be my guess. We'll come out with a new plan right before election. I'll extend your unemployment benefits for another 40 years. Okay? I was talking to students at A&M the other night. I wouldn't be surprised between now and the end of the year. You know all these students have these big student loans out? A lot of them. And you're having trouble paying them? Well, why? if I'm him, why wouldn't I come out and say, you know what? Uh, got, uh, I guess you got an election come up here in November. Uh, I was telling this to the students. I said, what if I walked into class tomorrow and said, if you vote for me, I'm going to forgive all the student loans in America. Think I'd buy some votes? That's how it works in America. You promise people stuff you can't pay for, and then they elect you. That's it. That's what our economic system, our political system, has devolved to. We'll see if that works or not. We'll see if it happens or not. I heard a guy the other day, no, it's not the other day, a year and a half ago now, it's the president of the Atlanta Fed. His last name's Lacker. I can't remember what his first name is. I heard him say a statement when somebody asked him a question in a Q&A and said, is there any likelihood the U.S. credit rating could be downgraded? And his answer, the Federal Reserve guys never say anything of substance. It's against their rules. They can't do it. Okay? But they kind of get caught off guard in Q&A once in a while. They ask him that. Is there anything, any reason we should worry about U.S. credit getting downgraded? And his answer was, we should, it's no longer prudent to consider the unthinkable impossible. Do you know what happens when unemployment benefits start to decline dramatically? People go back and get a job. I wrote a blog, Back to Work, about two, two months ago. And I've given this speech in Laredo, Texas, talking about this topic. Laredo's where all the trucks come up from I-35, right? We're on I-35 here in Des Moines. You're seeing them too. I see them in Austin. You see them up here on their way to Duluth. I'm talking to the truck owner down there. He comes up to me after the speech and he goes, Hey, let me tell you a little story about that. I'm trying to hire drivers down here, and I had a guy in my office the other day trying to hire him, and offered him a job, and he said, you know what? Based on the unemployment benefits I'm drawing and the income I'm getting from my job that I'm not reporting to the government, I'd have to take a pay cut to work for you. And my, my daughter's girlfriend, about 33 years old, been on unemployment benefits for about 52 weeks or so. The benefits ran out, she had a job a week after. Just a nice little vacation. Not everybody in this country is a helpless victim like your media want, and, and some people in our country want to make out. The American people are strong. They can compete in a global economy. They're not helpless victims. And darn it, if you bought a house and paid too much for it, refinanced it seven times, that's your fault. You lose. Foreclose on the home. Go rent for a while and get over it. Okay? Don't get it. anymore because let me tell you something I've had a hundred people ask me to run for office in the last year and I tell them I couldn't possibly run for federal office because I pay my income tax <laughs> and nobody's listening to me so just you guys I'll say something you might like just forget it they're not listening to it at all they will at some point as long as this continues to decline I'm gonna look like a genius by forecasting that unemployment is going to continue to decline now I, I heard Vince say he thought unemployment could start going up in the middle of the year next year. I'm not disagreeing with him, but all I know is this is a powerful argument against that because the American people will go back to work when their benefits run out. Look at manufacturers new work. Here's a little positive secret that's not getting much play either in a land of nothing but victims that you see you're dependent on the government. You can't succeed without my help as a government official. That's what they want you to think. Did you happen to notice that about two months ago, Toyota announced they're going to start making Camrys in America with American workers to export to Korea? What beautiful irony. The Japanese stole all of our jobs and all of our wealth in the 70s and 80s through a cheap currency, just like China's doing now. 
We called them on that at the Plaza Accord in 1986. Their currency is no longer cheap, it's really expensive, and guess what? They're not competitive with us anymore. They have to move jobs to America to sell their cars. It's cheaper for them to do it here than it is in Japan. We need to do that with China. China learned that from Japan. Cheat on your currency, you win. You get all the American wealth and all the American jobs. We've got to tell China to stop cheating on their currency too. Let their currency appreciate so that we can compete in a global economy with the rest of them. And you know what's going to happen? When that does happen, it is happening, just too slow for me. What happened when we called China, uh, Japan's bluff and their currency got real expensive? Do you know what they did when their currency got real expensive in the late 80s? They bought American real estate. You remember that? You remember when they were buying everything inside? Skyscrapers at record prices, farmland. They meant the only thing I advised the Chinese if they asked me to be an advisor to not repeat what happened in Japan, I would say, look, here, here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to do like Japan did and buy something of strategic national interest because Japan decided to buy Pebble Beach and turn it into a private country club. That was the end of the party for Japan. Here's why our manufacturing is going up, is because we're devaluing our currency. This is the trade way to value the dollar against all the other currencies. Over the last, do you see a trend here? You don't need to have a PhD in statistics here to see the 25, 30 year trend here is going down. We're making the value of our dollar cheaper. That sounds kind of bad. If you listen to Larry King, King dollar, King dollar, King dollar. Well, King dollar makes it impossible for American agriculture, uh, American manufacturing to compete. This is the opposite of King dollar. This is Queen dollar, or Jack dollar, whatever it is. It's going down in value, and that's part of the reason people are buying gold. But it's going down in value. The bad side is it makes your savings worth less, but the good side of it is it creates jobs for manufacturing in America. Every issue has a good side and a bad side. People say, well, what do you think about this? I have to ask them, well, what's your point of view? You a seller or a buyer? You a lender or an owner? It, it, there's always two sides to the story. This cheap dollar policy is causing the rebound in manufacturing in America. That is good for the manufacturers in Iowa. I can promise you that. But it's also, you show this slide, and people that have 400 ounces of gold are going to go out and buy another 200 ounces tomorrow. And the people that are thinking about buying farmland, they're going to be thinking, I better buy some more. Because if the trade weighted value is at 76 now, what's to say it won't be a 55 two years from now if we do print more money, like some people say we might. So retail sales are back up. Auto sales, we're even buying cars and trucks again. Here's two investment themes that I know work. Okay, I'm not a registered securities dealer, so I can't promise you anything. But I've learned two things in my lifetime. One is don't short sell America for very long. That's a bad bet, okay? And the second one is, I just learned this in the last eight years. You can guarantee this one too. This is more certain than death and taxes, and that's this. Americans do not tolerate deferred gratification. <laughs> we don't. We want our stuff and we want it now. Our fleet of vehicles out there, I saw on CNBC a couple of days ago, is that our, our fleet of cars is older than it ever has been. We've been postponing buying cars for three years. We've been postponing buying houses for three or four years. We've been postponing investing in real estate for three or four or five years. I've heard people talk about postponing getting married because of the economy. And I've even heard people say we've postponed getting a divorce because of the economy. That's called pent-up demand. That's what creates that spring-loaded check-in-the-box I was talking about. Because there's a bunch of people that have been postponing decisions that don't really want to. And they're starting to buy again. They're starting to buy cars and trucks. Think about it, for those of you that got teenage kids, maybe you got a 14 year old girl in middle school. She comes home and she goes, Mom, I have such a self esteem problem because my phone is four, four steps back from the cutting edge. And Lisa and everybody else has the latest iPhone 4, and it's killing my self esteem. And I'm thinking about starting to take drugs if I don't get a new phone. <laughs> Here's two, okay? That's how Americans work. We don't do that before gratification. Okay, so there's the good stuff. That's why we should be in a big growth spur. Why are we not? This is going to be the roadmap or the checklist of things for you and me to watch. And then hopefully our Congress and our President will identify each of these things and fix them. Because if they don't, 
We can have a recession in this country for 20 years. How that be? Japan, we are repeating the experience that Japan had when they had a bubble burst in the real estate market and their stock market. How's this for an experience that we're replicating that I don't want to have happen? The Japanese stock market crashed in 1989. The Nikkei was at 38.5, and as they said here this morning, it's 8,500. That means their stock market is off 75% from the peak 22 years later and commercial real estate declined in value for 12 to 15 years and their government is the most heavily, you don't hear that story either do you, that Japan is the most heavily indebted country on earth. That's what the Japanese experience is and that experience was done because they weren't willing to recognize the losses in the banking system and foreclose on the commercial real estate and foreclose on the houses and sell them to investors and take the losses close the banks that lose, and re-energize the new banks and start over again. That's called the Japanese experience. That's what we do not want to have happen. Anybody you see and related to Washington, D.C., just say, what are you doing to help us avoid the Japanese experience? And the answer right now is nothing. We are doing everything we can to exactly replicate that. Here's, what the, here's where we are today. I would switch my title of my speech at this point to making business and investment decisions in a world of continuous exogenous shocks. Okay? Exogenous shocks, what that means in economics, you can have a model. See, you hire me as an economist and say, I want you to forecast hamburger sales because I'm going to open up a chain of burgers in Des Moines. I want you to forecast that. So I get this little model going, and so I can kind of forecast how, how burger sales go. That's called an economic model. Now, the economic, the exogenous shock is something that comes out of nowhere that nobody could predict or explain, and it completely blows the model up, and you don't sell half the hamburgers you thought. An exogenous shock. Exogenous shocks, by definition, are supposed to be random and unpredictable. And when they happen, it upsets all your investment plans. See, you know what an exogenous shock would be in the morning if you woke up tomorrow morning and found out Congress worked 24 hours overnight last night and came to a bipartisan, unanimous agreement to balance the budget in three years. You would, that would be an exogenous shock. Everybody that owns gold would be crushed overnight. See, the model is Congress won't do anything right, and they'll print a lot of money, so gold and farmland keep going up. That's the model. The exogenous shock is the unpredictable. I'm a, I'm a golf, my dad's a golf pro, so I'm going to use a golf pro metaphor here. Like the economic model might be, I go to the pro and say, pro, I need some help. I want to try to break 90 again. What do I need to know? The model is, Mark, keep your right elbow in, you'll be good. You'll drop three sh shots off from score. So I go up to the first tee, think about the economic model. Keep my right arm in, I hit that ball, 260, right down the middle. And I'm thinking, that economic model works. Here's the exogenous shock when I walk off the tee, get struck by lightning, and I'm dead. <laughs> and I don't get to finish. Okay? <laughs> Now here's the situation, if you're an investor, a business person who hires people, this is why the hiring is so sluggish, because this is what an investor and a business owner would like to see, stable conditions where you can plan and execute and make a profit. Unfortunately, this isn't what it looks like. Here's the viewpoints from investors right now. It's not just one lightning bolt, it's a continuous barrage of lightning bolts. This is what it looks like from a business owner's perspective, and here's what it looks like from a retiree's perspective. This is why people are hoarding cash, and it's distorting every kind of investment market. I used to recommend tips. That was the other alternative to gold. I'd tell people, look, you don't need to buy gold and risk commodity speculation. You can either buy farmland, or you can buy tips. Inflation protected U.S. Treasuries. Well, I can't recommend that anymore because everybody's doing that now. The last tips auction went off with a negative yield, a five-year bond guaranteed to lose you money. <laughs> Who's going to buy that? Okay? See, it's a distorted market. And here's what, I wanna, here's what these lightning bolts are. If I'm a business person or investor, what will employee health care costs? What corporate income tax and individual rates going to be? 
What's the cap gains tax rate going to be? I heard the other night we're worried about what the estate tax rates are going to be again. When will Congress turn loose a Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? How long will it take to foreclose on four and a half to six billion homes? Why not give incentives to people to buy foreclosed homes? Will large European banks fail this year? They've already failed. They're just standing up. They're zombie banks that are dead that are still standing up. When will U.S. regulators allow banks in America to start lending for real estate again? And how will they comply with Dodd-Frank? Our friends in the banking business are under enormous duress. Dodd-Frank has over 400 rules in it that haven't even been written yet. It's a nightmare. This health care thing is a nightmare. Businessmen and women don't have a clue what their costs are going to be. That's why they're not hiring. You can lower interest rates to nothing. Sure, go ahead and lower interest rates. Go ahead and print a trillion and a half dollars and lower interest rates another half percent. Do you think business people are going to bite on that? Give them a tax credit, $500 tax credit to hire somebody. Do you think they're stupid enough to bite on that either? All of these things have to be fixed. Your Congress has to wake up some morning and say, we're going to overhaul all the tax rules, and then we're going to leave them in place for 10 years, and then we're going to walk away. You businesses may like some of it, you may not like some of it, but tough, that's what it is. But at least you've got the rule set for the next decade, and now you can make some plans and figure out how to make money and start hiring people again. So. With that in mind, I'm going to go to the, oh, 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 I want this one on. Now I'm going to go to the conclusions, because we want to have a little Q&A, maybe, if you want to. Here's what Ben Bernanke won't tell you. This is why I don't get invited to ever speak or be parts of Federal Reserve events, since I wrote a blog about Federal Reserve policy impoverishing grandma, which it is. Let me illustrate that. My mom's 88 years old. Dad died three years ago put some of her money in an annuity with New York Life at 5.5% interest. It's an eight-year annuity with three years at 5.5. The three years is up. They just renewed it for 1.5. So what is her income is off 75%. What would you call that? I call that impoverishment. Well, it's just not my mom. It's everybody with like, you don't hear this. All you hear out of CNBC is, well, our Federal Reserve policy keep interest rates low to stimulate people to buy houses. That's not helping people buy houses. Mortgage rates are ridiculously low right now. Mortgage rates can go to 5% and people would still think it's ridiculously low or even 6% for that matter. But look what's happening. You never hear them talking about the damage this is doing to people. Your income. Yeah, you're people talking about how income, well, we heard Ben say that. Income isn't going up. That's true. Well, think about your income. It comes from wages. It comes from interest on the bonds and mortgages you own, the dividends on stocks, and the transfer payments you get from government, welfare and all the rest of that, Social Security and all the rest of that. I haven't heard anybody talking lately about this. The amount of income that you get, and all of our cousins and brothers and sisters all over America, from interest on your bonds, has gone down from five and a half trillion dollars in 08 to four trillion this year. That's a trillion and a half dollars of spendable income that you could have been buying a house or a second car or taking a vacation that you don't have, complements a Federal Reserve monetary policy. And I ask you, what is that? Who's benefiting from interest rates at zero? I can guarantee you it's the people that work for a living and pay taxes on their income and they've got a savings account earning nothing out of it, they're not getting any benefit. I'm going to get more frank as I go along here. <laughs> I'm going to close. Actually, I'm going to close on this. I think job growth, well, I want to get to this one. i got to get to this one. Capital flows. There's too much money chasing deals around the globe, and there's been too much money for 20 or 30 years. And that's called hot money, and it goes someplace, and it invests, creates bubbles, blows them up, and then goes on to the next thing. And I started tracking this a decade ago. It used to be U.S. commercial real estate. Some of you old enough in the room remember, good times to be in real estate, 1983 to 86. Blew the prices up, it collapsed. And then the money went to Japan, and their stock market exploded in 1989 and collapsed. And then it was over to Asian Tigers. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Korea, Thailand, and all of a sudden those bursts were the Russian ruble crisis. 
And then all of a sudden, the money came to the U.S. and the U.S. stock market. We had the dot-com bubble. And then that burst. And then what happened? We had a bubble in commercial real estate and residential real estate. And that blew up and then it burst. And then it was BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Those parties are over. They're not dead, but those parties are, are increasing at a much slower rate. That story is over. And commodities, that story is still lingering. Those are still there. And there's a bubble now in U.S. treasuries and the price of gold and the Swiss franc and trophy commercial real estate. I don't have time to explain that. Just big buildings in New York and Boston, San Francisco and Washington, D.C. So where, what asset class isn't grossly overvalued? And in my mind, it's two things. Stocks in America, the U.S. stock market, and not only commercial real estate, but also residential real estate. Those are the only asset classes I know of that aren't at record high prices. That's where this money will ultimately flow. It does it year in and year out, decade, decade out, blows up an asset class until they destroy it, and then they move on to the next thing. And in my mind, that's the next thing coming down the road. So in conclusion, an old economist told me every economist should use words in conclusion in their speech to give their audience hope. Well, I'm dead. I just said it. I think job growth is going to be positive in 2012. I think private sector is going to continue to hire because of the profits. And I think the job growth could be actually a little stronger than it was in 2011 because I don't think government's going to have to lay off as hard as they did in 2011. States, cities, counties, the U.S. as a whole. So our job growth is likely to be positive but modest and interest rates should stay low and businesses are going to be retarded from hiring because of all of this uncertainty in Washington that hopefully will be resolved in favor of business creation in November. So anyhow, with that, turn it back to the boss. Let's give you a round of applause.